And we continue our candidate interviews for the riding of Cape Breton Canso by welcoming to Talil Community Television the new Democratic candidate for the riding in this election. Jana Reddick joins us from her office in Glace Bay. Jana, thank you so much for giving me some time on Talil 24-7 today. I'm really excited to uh, be here and, you know, I'm glad to be doing all this, these interviews and hoping to get people to know me a little bit better. So thanks for having me on. Well, it's our pleasure. We're, you're very welcome. And I want to begin quickly by asking you how the campaign is going. Uh, we're down to two weeks before the actual vote. We're in the home stretch. Uh, how do you feel things have gone for you throughout this big ride? It's going pretty well. Um, I, I have been doing a lot of kind of getting out and talking to people. Uh, door to door has kind of been hard for me because I'm dealing with, I'm gonna have to get a hip replacement at the end of this month or early October, hopefully. So I haven't been able to hit as many doorsteps as I, I wanted to, but I'm hoping to change that in the next two weeks and try to just power through the pain and get out there. But I think it's going well, so. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, hopefully uh, that will be able to go well for you over the final two weeks. Now, you decided to run this past spring and you brought up that you need a hip replacement. But I understand that your own health situation played a role in you choosing to run for federal politics and to run for the NDP as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah. So back in 20... I want to say it was 2018. Yeah, 2018. No, 2019. So it was 2019. Uh, I was, I had found a lump. I had a lump in my breast at the time. I had it checked a few times and they had told me that it was benign. Um, and then I ended up finding a lump in my armpit. So I had to go to a walk-in clinic to, because I didn't have a family doctor at the time. And uh, anyway, he ordered an ultrasound and things like that. And it turned out that I had breast cancer. So it had spread to my lymph nodes. So at the time it was around stage three, uh, maybe stage two, but it was stage three eventually. And so I ended up having to go through all the treatment. I did around nine rounds of chemo, 30 radiation treatments and uh, a mastectomy where I lost my left breast and a I don't even know how many lymph nodes. I'm going to say 30 something. And uh, then, you know, I, it was good for a while. And then I ended up getting spine metastasis uh, just to one vertebrae on my spine. So now I'm kind of living with stage four, but I have a wonderful team at the Cape Breton um, Cancer Center here. And I find that yeah, I only had to go up to Halifax twice once for my mastectomy and another for my uh, i had to get two rounds of radiation that were uh, specifically used in a radiation machine that's up in halifax that i think we're trying to get down here but it's, it's pretty expensive so it's hard uh for them to kind of get the funding um but because of that and getting sick and and meeting people in the chemo room that would have to be, you know, going back to work after chemo or had work the next day or were telling me that they had to pay out of pocket for the meds that cost $1,500, $2,000 because it's not covered under their plan. But, you know, even the fact that I had to go to a walk-in clinic instead of having somebody that I could would have been able to go to beforehand, uh, to kind of check out my, the lump. Uh, I ended up getting a family doctor. The first time I met her was when I got uh, the news that she had to tell me that I had breast cancer. So that, that was the very first time I met her. So, you know, I, because of all those things, it, it really opened my eyes to how, you know, ruthless and terrible the, system is here the healthcare system and i that really inspired me to decide you know if i want to see change i think that i have to be the one to try and make it so um i want to try and get it better so nobody has to go through 
the rigmarole that I did to get diagnosed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And just picking up on that, Jana, you've talked about the cost of the medication that you've needed just to be able to take care of some of these things. Yep. And that connects to the NDP's federal plan for a national pharmacare program. It has been promised by the Trudeau Liberals. It hasn't taken shape. So do you feel like your own personal experience in that regard made you a natural fit for not only what the NDP is pledging, but also what your leader, Jagmeet Singh, has identified as a priority for Canadians? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the NDP has always been ahead of the times a little bit with the, you know, the belief of always taking care of people. And, you know, it's it's about that we're all you know equal and everybody should have a fair chance and nobody should be able to buy M money shouldn't distinguish what your treatment is or if you're allowed to survive and so because like the ndp has that pharmacare right in the plan or right in the commitments right in their the the um you know, they're all of their things that I think that that's definitely what attracted me. I, I always enjoyed, you know, Joe Meat and his amazingness with his beliefs and um, how he truly just wants to fight for everybody. Um, but I think pharmacare is such an issue for so many people. Um, you know, people will say, you know, you get healthcare. Well, a lot of jobs don't give you uh, the, you know, the coverage to cover a lot of the drugs. And then they, if you do, then you're paying out of your pay that, you know, if you're making $800 every two weeks, well, taking health plan off that, you're left with, you can't, you won't even be able to pay rent and eat. So that's why, I kind of really think that the NDP are the best party to implement this because, you know, I, I was talking to, uh, I was interviewed recently and um, somebody told me that the liberals had put it out there that they would do, you know, low income for like, that's who they would give pharmacare for, but there's already programs that exist for, for low income people and pharmacare, right? The problem is, is that people that are, you know, stuck in the middle of that, they have a job, but the job isn't getting them through to payday. So they're getting, you know, they're, they're in debt after all of the things that go on, or they, you know, they run out of Monday money by the Monday before payday, mm -hmm. and they can't afford to get all of the, you know, drugs they need. And that, that's why pharmacare has to be something that's considered for all of us because right now pharmaceutical companies are just able to write what they want for us. And that's just what we have to pay. And I think that if there's drugs out there that can save somebody's life, there should never be a price tag on that. Um, and that's why that matters so much to me. And I imagine, as you've mentioned, you're hearing that on the doorstep as you go from door to door in this campaign and as you're speaking to people in different areas. What are some of the other key issues that you're hearing on a regular basis? And how do you feel that electing you and also electing more New Democrats would help answer some of these questions that some of the people here have? You know, really, we I've heard about affordability uh, with whether it's with renting uh, because how expensive renting can be for people here or even buying a house. People can't afford to buy houses here now because people are coming in and offering double what people are able to list it as. So now not only are we paying astronomically through, uh, like through our noses for rent, we can't even buy a house because 
a down payment isn't something that you can save for in the first place, let alone being outbid by people who don't even live in Cape Breton and are buying land here because, you know, whether it's the pandemic was the, it was one of the safest places or whatever the view is on why people are buying here. But I think that is something that I've, I've heard a lot of. Um, another thing that I've heard a lot of is, you know, um, that people are really annoyed and tired here in Cape Breton. And I think all across Nova Scotia with the, the fact that this election was in two weeks already while we were still in like uh, the Nova Scotia election, you know? So people are tired and they're annoyed and they feel like their voice never, or their vote never matters. And so I, I think really a lot of times I've gone to doorsteps and people have been saying, you know, I, I'm exhausted, like nothing's going to change anyway. Why should I vote? And I, I can't say I blame them. You know, it it's really discouraging when you feel like your voice is never being heard and yes. nobody ever stands up for you. Uh, and so for me, that's something that really matters because the, like I know that here in Cape Breton, we are a lot, and, and you know, not just in Cape Breton, Kanzo, Tua, and like up in Guysboro and around that area, I don't, by no means do I want to leave them out. I feel like really a lot of times they kind of get left behind um, because the focus is on Cape Breton so often that nobody kind of fights for them even harder. So um, I think this entire riding suffers from the fact that a lot of times people who are kind of well off or, you know, are, are really politicians and not like, you know, people that have been in the job force or the, yeah, the workforce or, you know, um, like I've worked in nonprofits for my whole life, or I've worked with youth um, for the government or, I did access for families who had their children taken away from them and I would supervise their visits. And I, I'm, I'm not well off, I, I'm by no means rich. This is definitely a, a poor campaign. It's all donations here. I can't afford to fund my campaign or anything along those lines. But I think a lot of people can understand that because they have those struggles and they have, they know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck or even paycheck to payday loan or uh, paycheck to overging their credit cards. So I think people around here need to have somebody that represents them in parliament that understands what it's like to not have that doctor, to not have somebody fighting for you, to not have money that, that can't afford healthcare because they're working at a job they hate for mi minimum wage peanuts and you know they can't save they can't do anything to make their lives better because they're stuck in this rut and I think somebody like that somebody that understands people here have to or should be who's running or who represents us here in Ottawa, because I think it's very easy to not understand what people go through here on a daily basis if you've never experienced poverty or having to choose to pay the electric bill or buy groceries, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what matters to a lot of people. And those people should be able to have somebody in that this like representing this riding that can honestly say you know i've been there i've been in the dirt with you guys i know what it's like to struggle and i want to fight for all the things that you want because we deserve it here and there should be no reason for us to have to be second class to other parts
Jana, I wanted to devote the next part of the interview to past, present, and future in terms of politics here in Cape Breton, Guysborough County, and Antigonish County, which take in the riding of Cape Breton Canso. This is a place that has elected New Democrats in the past. Uh, Father Andy Hogan was the Member of Parliament for Cape Breton, the Sydneys, uh, for many years in the 70s. Uh, Michelle Dockerell winning a new version of the riding, Bredor Cape Breton, in the late 90s, uh, defeating a powerful Liberal cabinet minister, David Dingwall, in the process. He, of course, now the president of CBU. And there have been some strong female candidates for the NDP in recent years, including the former mayor of Mulgrave, Marnie Simmons, and Port Oxbury community activist, Shirley Hardery. What does it mean to you to know that those names have had some success in this area and may have planted NDP seeds that could blossom for you and for future NDP candidates here? Well, I think really the NDP was always, for a long time, it was the working man's party, the the worker party, um, you know, fighting with unions and uh, ta- like helping them out and uh, you know, not fighting against, but fighting for or with them uh, is what I mean to say. And, you know, I think that really a lot of people here, um, here in Cape Breton and, you know, like you said, uh, Guysboro, Anaganish County, things like that, I think, or places like that, I believe that that the NDP belief is still there that they fight for the people, they fight for the people that work, they fight for um, the the rights of the, the, the rights of, you know, everyday people or um, they really they they fought for being able to have Labor Day or things like that. Just, you know, they fight for us. And I think because of that, the NDP roots are here because we, like I said, we all know that. And it comes back to that struggle that, that the NDP is the one that'll help you with the struggle. Um, And I think because of that, that's why the NDP seeds are still there and being sown. And, you know, I definitely think, especially with women running so much more often, it it made me feel more comfortable being able to put myself out there and, uh, you know, having not just women, but seeing people that weren't just, for lack of a better word, career politicians going into it or seeing people that actually want to make a difference and get away from the quo is why I think the NDP still has a little bit of power here um in this riding because really if we you know if we were able to um for some reason i think that the government or different parties have kind of told us that you know going into debt and the country going into debt and because of all the things that the NDP want to do with money and all those things like that, that's going to affect us in our everyday lives. And, and it, that's terrible for us. And you don't want to vote for the NDP because they'll spend too much money. Well, you know, I think it very much showed us during the pandemic that helping people out and giving them money and um, like what they needed to survive is what should be done and what needs to be done. And the NDP are the ones that fought for that. And that, you know, that gross domestic product or whatever it uh, it is, isn't our responsibility to take care of. It's the government's and the government should be taking care of our lives. Um, And really that's why I think that you know, that's why the NDP still lives there here in, in this writing. And I think really the liberals have held it for so long because, uh, you know, part the, the NDP has fluctuated and the liberals have always, you know, they have more, they have more money than the NDP and they have this like access and 
So I think that's why they've been more so successful um, and why the NDP hasn't really been able to get very far. But I think I think we're I'm hoping that we're on a swing of the pendulum that isn't going to go loop back to conservative. I'm hoping that it'll kind of loop again and we can just go directly into what we hope for our lives. And that's the NDP and what they want. Well, Jana, let's look ahead to the present and the future, because while the recent provincial election has shown us that polling isn't always accurate, the recent polling in terms of this federal election has shown us that we could well be returning to another minority government situation, whether that's liberal or conservative. The NDP, of course, has played some key roles in minority governments of the past 15 years, not just Mr. Trudeau, but also Mr. Harper and Paul Martin back in the early 2000s. So what kind of sense do you get about what kind of an impact if more NDP candidates are elected, such as yourself, that it could have not only on the new parliament going in, but also on the future of Canada? Oh, well, you know, like, I think the NDP is always a great kind of opposition party to have. I think that um, a lot of times minority governments are kind of exactly what the people want or, or really what is best for the country. Because, you know, people, they keep, they keep the, the leading party accountable. They make sure that they are asking for what Canadians want. And I think obviously the NDP showed how powerful they can be in this, uh, in that, in, in this role during a pandemic, because, you know, you look at CERB, well, Trudeau wanted to, and the Liberals, they wanted CERB to be $1,000. Well, $1,000 isn't getting anybody through a month, or, or through the a two-week period or a month or whatever it was, like, that's, it's not happening, you know? And, um, you know, they wanted to give a 10% wage subsidy, and the NDP fought for it to be 75%. And because of that minority power, those things were able to be given and were able to change because the leading party has no choice but to play ball. So in this situation, if there is a minority government, the NDP does gather more seats and is able to kind of sway one way or another. I think obviously, that's beneficial, not just for the, you know, all the people in parliament, but I think right across Canada, because like I said, they, this way there's more representation of what people actually want instead of a ruling party that isn't gonna listen to people that don't align with their views or, uh, you know, they just have the power and nothing, nobody can stop them so that they're just can do whatever they want. Right. And I think that's why minority governments are really quite extremely powerful and good for the country, in my opinion. So the last question I have for you, Jana, is about representation. And if you are elected as the MP for Cape Breton Canso on September 20th, you would not only be the first LGBTQI MP from this area, you'd also be the first half black candidate to win the seat for Cape Breton Canso and for this part of Nova Scotia. And I want to ask you a bit about what that means to you looking at your son, Kale, who you're raising with your partner, Ashley, what kind of impact do you think that would make, not just on him, but also on people in these communities and people outside of these communities to be able to have that kind of representation for this area in Parliament? It'd be wonderful for Kale to see, really, and all kinds of children. Kale is a wonderful little boy that he expresses himself and, you know, doesn't, he, he's only 10, he's, he's turning 11, and he doesn't have to to succumb to, you know, the stereotypes that are put on little boys that make it so hard to be like little boys growing up in this world right now. 
and I think that if they're able to see that equality where anybody can run and anybody is able to kind of change the world in some way, I think that really it could get this next generation coming up, Kale and like his generation, it could make them believe that they can change the world too. And I always say that I think they're the ones that are really make going to make the difference. I think, you know, we we're trying here, but I think that generation coming up is just going to be like, what were you guys doing? You know? So, uh, and really as, like you said, I'll be the first queer person of color in this writing. I think as a, a queer individual, I think obviously it's, it's always wonderful to see a person living out loud and open in any type of uh, career or public body or anything like that, because it sucks to this day, children are still having trouble with coming out to their parents or in some countries, it's still able to, you're still able to be in, thrown in jail or even killed if you're gay. And in my lifetime, I was able to see gay marriage get legalized, you know? So uh, I, like, that's just in my lifetime. It, mm. So it's not even that long ago that I wouldn't have had the same rights as uh, somebody that, as, as a lot of my best friends or anything like that. And really, because I'm, you know, my father's black and my mother's white, um, I think that truly that knowing that I would have been illegitimate, I, I wouldn't have been worthwhile at, at one point in this world. It, and my parents weren't allowed to get married at some point because of that, because my dad and my mom, their marriage might not have been able to be a thing. I think being a person that has always has has known that you know my existence wouldn't have been accepted or my like my sexuality wasn't accepted and all of those things so I I know what it's like to be left out or that you have to hide things or that you're not that you really wouldn't have had the same rights and you are a second class citizen uh in this world because of that I think really that is able to, or it gives me the understanding of, of what a lot of people here in Cape Breton feel, uh, you know, not just people of color, but really people that are living in poverty and people that are like always feel like the system is stacked against them because really in, you know, in, in Cape Breton and in, uh, Guysboro and in Aganish County and Canso and all these things. So many of us live, like I said, paycheck to paycheck or having to choose between the electric bill or the groceries or your phone bill or being able to get your kids school supplies or things like that. That makes you feel secondary. That lack of safety net that you have when you're unable to save money or always be marked as, you know, even people that are struggling with addiction, all of these things make society makes you feel like you don't matter that things that this is, you know, you should just be grateful to be at the table. Just because you're at the table doesn't mean you should talk, but you should just be grateful to be here. And, you know, I, for me, I, I just decided enough is enough. And, you know, people have to fight. Somebody has to get up and be that first person to be, to say, you know, I want to, I, I think there has to be more colored faces at this at this party. And I think there has to be gayer people at this party. And I think that trans people should run. And I think that 
former addicts should run and all of these things, because that's what this country, that's what this community is made of, is people that struggle and people that work hard and people that are at the lowest points of their life, but still are able to crawl out of them. And somebody needs to be able to understand what that's like. And I do. And, you know, people don't get to see themselves on TV or represented. Uh, like I said, I, I grew up where gay marriage was illegalized. I, I grew up before I was never able to see a, like two girls kiss on a TV show or something like that, because that was so against societal norms. So mm -hmm. it makes you feel like something's wrong with you. And it wasn't until I was able to see more representation of what I felt or who I was in a community and that I belong to a community and that those things don't define me. They're a part of me, but they're not my definition. Mm -hmm. That made me feel as if I could be that voice at the very least that makes people realize that they are needed and you know like there's there's a, a population of black people across this entire riding and mm. yeah I, they've never seen somebody of their own uh race be able to be a part of this uh or help with this riding and mm. you know as a light-skinned black person i I get certain privileges and, you know, maybe one of my privileges is be, or because of that privilege, I'm able to not just maybe I am, I'm able to get certain things that people with darker skin um, and are black wouldn't be able to. And that's despicable to say, but it's true because that's systemically what happens. Um, but that like that's all the more reason that if I'm able to climb through a door or, you know, if I'm able to walk through it, well, then I'm opening a window and the rest of you are climbing in. Like, because there's no person left behind. We all need that help and we all need that security and we need somebody who understands us and is fighting for all the things that we truly need in this riding, not just what our party tells us and not just what our donors tell us. And we need what matters to these people. And, you know, like I said, people don't get out to vote because they don't believe that somebody's going to represent them or it never changes. Well, I can promise you that if I was to be the person that gets in, I'll, I'll, I will be the person that is defending every single person and working for every person to try and make this place better and more sustainable where your families can stay and be here, whether you're straight, gay, bi, trans, Black, white, indigenous, anything at all, you should be able to live in your home and stay close to your family and friends and be able to build a life here where you can not just get by, not just survive, but be able to thrive here. And that's what I want to give this community because, you know, getting cancer was the thing that gave me a new lease on life and it, it it reminded me how amazing having a community that cares about you is uh and how it can change how you feel about yourself and i want to make this community feel like they have that person that's doing that for them and that's a good 
positive, hopeful note on which to wrap up this interview, Jana. And I want to thank you very much for giving me some time here. I know it's a busy day for you at your office in Glace Bay, but we wish you the very best for your candidacy in Cape Breton Cancer. And uh, Jana Reddick, thank you for joining me on Tail Hill 24-7 today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks.